in South Africa, President Jacob Zuma announces that he is resigning. We start with a school shooting in Broward County, north of Miami. Authorities say the gunman has just been taken into custody. As police and medical teams converged on the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School, students poured out into the streets. Emergency workers could be seen treated wounded people on the streets. While Broward officials have not yet announced an official number of casualties, U.S. Senator Bill Nelson told media sources that there were, quote, many deaths, unquote. As you can see in these live pictures, the area around the school is still an active crime and trauma scene. This is an ongoing story and we'll have an update later in the program. Now to Washington, where the U.S. Senate has finally started debate on immigration reform after two days of procedural fits and starts. Already, President Trump is increasing the odds of political gridlock by threatening to veto any bill that doesn't meet his hardline approach. While the Senate debates immigration, the House Oversight Committee announced it will investigate the White House's handling of ousted Abe Rob Porter. Let's talk about it with Arise News Chief Washington Correspondent Eric Ham. Welcome, Eric. Let's start with immigration. Hi, Agnes. How are you? Good. How are you? There are two deals out there, one by Senator Grassley, the other by, the other by so-called Gang of 20. What are the differences, and is there a deal on either? Well, actually, yeah, there are big differences between the two. The Grassley bill is a bill that is actually endorsed by the president. It covers his four key pillars. Uh, it ends uh, chain migration. It provides full funding for the wall, it ends the visa lottery, and it tightens border security. The bill that's being supported by the Gang of 20, it doesn't meet all four of those pillars, but some senators say that it has at least two of them in there. Now here's where it gets tricky. Many senators believe that the bill by the Gang of 20 can actually get through the Senate, whereas the bill by Senator Grassley cannot, and so they want to bring the bill by Chuck Grassley to the floor for a vote so they can reject it and then bring the other bill to the floor, the bill by the Gang of 20, which they believe will actually get through the Senate. Is the president veto threat influencing the debate at all? Well, it, it only is influencing the debate in that we see Senator Grassley actually developing a piece of legislation that makes sure that it includes all four pillars. In, in terms of actually what will get through the Senate, I'd have to say that's an unequivocal no because the bill that looks to be, that has the legs to get through is a bill that simply will not meet all four of the key pillars that the president would like to see. Moving to the Porter scandal that has consumed the White House, the president is breaking his silence after defending his ex-aide accused of spousal, spousal abuse. What exactly did he say? That's right. And we've, this scandal has been growing uh, more and more every day. And this has been going on for at least a week now. And so we finally hear from the president. And I'll just read what he said uh, today when he spoke actually on the issue. He said, and I quote, I am totally opposed to domestic violence, and everybody here knows that. I am totally opposed to domestic violence of any kind. Everyone knows that, and it almost wouldn't even have to be said. So now you hear it, but you all know it. So that's where the president has actually uh, made a quote, and we do know that he's been uh, tripped up by many of these issues for quite some time, and in fact, trying to quell the scandal. We also heard from Mike Pence today, the vice president, who said that this, this whole situation could have been handled better. What about the House oversight investigation? Tell us more about that and whether there would be any cooperation between the parties on such a hot button issue. Right, today, uh, Chairman of the uh, House Oversight Committee, Trey Gowdy, and as we know, Trey Gowdy is actually uh, uh, leaving Congress at the end of this year, but Trey Gowdy has actually said today, this morning, that he would like to open an investigation to see how someone like Porter could have access to the nation's most sensitive information without a permanent security clearance. And so he would like to move forward in terms of investigating this and looking more closely at how how members of the White House are actually getting clearances and what are they having access to, what information they have access to. He still is unclear what the investigation would look like or how far it would go. And of course, we still don't know where the Democrats stand on this, but we do know that the chairman of that committee is looking to move forward on this issue. Another member of the cabinet is under scrutiny for misusing government funds for travel. Who's under the microscope today? Right. I mean, we've seen so many uh, members of the president's cabinet now be tripped up by this issue of travel, and now it's uh, VA Secretary David Shulkin. Now, remember, David Shulkin is actually a holdover 
from the Obama administration. And so now it was the IG's office. And for our, for our viewers who, who just aren't aware, the, uh, the, the, in, the Inspector General's office is an ap apolitical, independent body of each uh, agency within the government. And so they did an investigation and found that the secretary uh, misappropriated more than $120,000 in funds, and that also his, his chief of staff actually uh, 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 refinagled uh, some emails, altered emails, to try to cover this up. And so now you have members of both sides of the aisle from the Congress actually calling on the secretary to make, make, make good on uh, this money that uh, the taxpayers have spent for this trip that he took uh, to Wimbledon last year. Well, after weeks of denials, President Trump's lawyer now admits he paid adult film star Stormy Daniels out of his own pocket. Does this in fact confirm there was a relationship between Trump and Daniels, and would this be legal? Well, we do know that after weeks of denials, now President Trump's longtime attorney, Michael Cohen, has actually come out and said that he actually did pay uh, this former adult film star $130,000. Now, he has not actually stated that there was a relationship between the film star and the president, but he did uh, confirm that he did make a payment to her, and he, and he was also clear to say that uh, that he was not reimbursed either by the Trump organization or by the Trump campaign. What he did manage to leave out was if he was reimbursed by the president himself. That's information that we still don't know, but this is, this is an ongoing uh, investigation, and we do know that the Common Cause, a nonprofit organization here in Washington, actually opened up this, uh, led to the opening of this investigation, and I'm sure this is something that perhaps uh, the independent investigator, uh, Mike M uh, Bob Mueller, would also like to look at. Well, Budget Director Mick Mulvaney was on the Hill today saying, among other things, the price tag for the president's desire to have a military parade could be as high as $30 million. Is this still on the table? Well, we do know that the president is some, this is something that he is keen to have take place. I do believe that the price tag is something that both, both uh, parties will balk at. But again, we still don't know if, the, if this is something that will actually happen, if it'll happen in Washington or someplace else. Uh, but we do know that the president is, is keen to move forward with this. We, and also we know that the Pentagon is still working up various options on how this would look and where it would possibly take place. Well, Mulvaney said yesterday if he was still in Congress, he wouldn't vote for the proposed budget. That's not exactly a big vote of confidence. It's not, it's not something that you want your OMB director actually saying before uh, Congress in a hearing. And so I think this is something, we already knew that this budget was, was dead on arrival when it got to the Congress, but to have your, 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 ch your chief budget person to actually say that this is something that even as a member of Congress, he could not support, I think it just shows you where this bill is actually going, and that's nowhere. And finally, another special election pickup by the Democrats. Eric, is a blue wave come forming, and is it being driven by Trump or other factors? Many on the, on the left are saying that this blue wave, the blue wave is actually here. Uh, this is actually the, uh, the, the 37th seat that has switched from red to blue in a special election since Donald Trump came into office. And this was in, uh, in the Florida area where it's a state legislative seat that switched over. And, and also to keep in mind, this is a district where Donald Trump actually won in the 2016 election. He won by five points. And so I think this is an area where now you see many Republicans becoming increasingly nervous that this blue wave is only getting bigger and bigger. Thank you, Eric Hammond, D.C. Now to breaking news in South Africa, where following years of corruption allegations and at the urging of his own party, President Jacob Zuma has resigned. Zuma made the announcement during a live speech to the nation tonight, saying, quote, I have served the people of South Africa to the best of my quote, ability, end quote. He said he was not afraid of the no-confidence vote threatened by the ANC. Deputy President Cyril Ramaphosa is expected to succeed Zuma as president.
Amid growing calls for his resignation, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Net Netanyahu continues to dismiss allegations of corruption. During an appearance today, Netanyahu dismissed the police investigations as, quote, full of holes like Swiss cheese, end quote. He assures that his government is stable and there is no plans for an election. Zimbabwe's main opposition leader, Morgan Changarai, has died. A senior official of his party said the 65-year-old former prime minister had been suffering from colon cancer. Changarai's career was marked by his long political struggle against former president Robert Mugabe. We want to go back to the scene in Broward County. As you can see in these live pictures, ambulances continue to take the injured to local hospitals. To update, the shooter is in custody. Broward County sheriffs say that at least 14 people have been in injured. U.S. Senator Bill Nelson says there were multiple deaths. We'll have more information as we get it. Next how Wall Street dealt with the unexpected higher inflation numbers, and will the release of a journalist in Ethiopia help calm the country? You're watching Arise America. Welcome back to Arise America. Just outside Washington, a scary moment today at the headquarters of the National Security Agency. The driver of an SUV tried to ram through the barricades of the secure campus. Three people were injured, including a police officer. Gunshots were fired during the incident. But authorities do not believe any of the injuries were caused by the gunfire. The FBI is still collecting evidence but right now considers it an isolated incident not related to terrorism. Arise News U.S. business editor Andrew Schmertz is off today. U.S. stocks shook off reports of inflation rising at a faster rate than expected to close higher for the fourth day in a row. All of the major indexes were up around 1% for the day. And a big drop in another economic indicator, U.S. retail sales in January recorded their biggest drop in nearly a year. 0.3% as households cut back spending on motor vehicles and building materials. And the Commerce Department revised data for December to show sales unchanged instead of the 0.4% rise previously reported. U.S. regulators are warning about possible engine shutdown risk on Airbus jets. The Federal Aviation Administration issuing a formal warning about the new engines made by Pratt & Whitney for the latest Airbus A320 jetliner. Pratt acknowledges the problem and is proposing a fix. Finally, a rose is a rose and a lesson in glo and globalization. The majority of roughly 200 million roses that Americans give to each other today come from Colombia. The Colombian rose industry bloomed after the, after the U.S. disrupted cocaine trafficking and the expansion of free trade agreements. Colombia will ship four billion flowers this year, about a dozen for every resident. Jailed Ethiopian journalist Eskinder Nega was released from prison today. After seven years behind bars, his arrest and detention highlights an ongoing problem of press freedom across the African continent and indeed around the world. Here to discuss Iskinder's release and the challenges journalists are facing is Maria Salazar Ferro, Director of Emergencies at the Committee to Protect Journalists. Welcome, Maria. Thank you for having me. Uh, let's get our audience up to speed. Who is Iskinder Nega and why is he in jail? Why was he in jail for seven years? Skinder is um, an online columnist, uh, a journalist, an Ethiopian journalist, who has been very outspoken against the Ethiopian government. He was arrested in tw 2011 and charged with vague terrorism charges in 2012. He has since been in prison despite several appeals for his release. Mm -hmm. um, he was arrested in September of 2011 after he had written a couple of articles online, uh, mostly focused on the Arab Spring, which at the time was the news of the day. This landed him in prison, and a judge uh, during his conviction talked about how Iskinder was trying to incite similar types of violence and revolt in Ethiopia. Well, Mela Zenawi, uh, the late president of Ethiopia, enforced a crackdown on dissenters of the government. What was the impact and the long-term impact for journalists? 
So it's been a revolving door of journalists going in and out of prison in Ethiopia. In uh, 2012, when Iskinder was um, uh, sentenced, um, he was sentenced alongside several other journalists. Um, when at, at the time when they um, when they were in sentenced somewhere and sentenced in absentia, essentially the independent press in Ethiopia um, disappeared. It took a really hard hit. Um, since there's been, you know, it's been ups and downs. Um, two other bloggers today had charges dismissed against them, along with the Skinder. Uh, they were bloggers for the Zone 9 uh, blog um, that was created around the time of the Skinder's uh, imprisonment to fill that gap for independent news in the country. Well, this really highlights, you just announced the release of two more uh, journalists. There's definitely been a shift happening in Ethiopia. Can you tell me more about it and what was the, what's the cause behind it? So there have been massive, there's, the government has promised a massive change uh, that was in response to violence and to, to protest really that turned violent after two, 2015 land grab. Since then, uh, there have been a lot of releases of political prisoners and journalists. Before that, we had already seen some changes from 2016 to 2017. We had seen several journalists being released after they had served uh, the terms of their sentencing. But right now, today, no journalists remain in prison, according to our research in Ethiopia. The term fake news is kind of reached a zeitgeist globally. How has that term impacted journalists around the world? So this, uh, in December, we do our end of the year census and we look at how many journalists in the world are imprisoned. And at the end of 2017, we had a record number of 262 journalists who had been in- 263. 262 journalists wow, who had been in prison worldwide. Um, about 75% um, of them were uh, convicted on anti-terror charges, not dissimilar to those that Iskinder was convicted under, and 21 were imprisoned on charges of fake news. This was a pretty steep increase from nine that we had documented the year before. It's um, a narrative that's coming up more and more in governments that feel criticized, and it's a narrative that, as you know, we've seen come up a lot in the U.S. as well. Well, Ethiopia isn't the only country where journalists are facing uh, resistance of press freedom. Do you have some other countries that are on your radar right now? When talking about journalists who've been imprisoned, uh, the top jailers of journalists in the world are China, Turkey, and, um, or rather it's Turkey, China, and Egypt. But there are other countries uh, and other dangers that journalists face. In Iraq and in Syria, journalists have been continuously killed for their reporting on the conflicts there. But there are other countries um, where there's, there's no active military conflict, like Mexico, where journalists are routinely killed and their, their killers fail to be imprisoned. So this is an, another form of attack on the press, impunity for their killings. Well, Iskinder was just released today. He's still in Ethiopia. Is it safe for him to still be there right now? That's a good question. Um, there have been, again, several releases in the past year, and those journalists remain in Ethiopia, remain free. He put out a release today of his own saying he would continue to fight, and he suspects that he might do a third or fourth really stint in prison. It's unclear what will happen, but his family's in the U.S. and we'll, you know, we'll stay tuned and hope for the best for his kinder. Thank you so much. That's Maria Salazar-Ferro of the Committee to Protect Journalists. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for having me. Next, the latest on the Florida school shooting. We now know the, the identity of the shooter. You're watching Arise America. <laughs> We want to go back to the scene in Broward County. As you can see in these live pictures, crowds have gathered around the scene. The sheriff's office is asking parents and loved ones to not go there, but to the established reunion area. Here's what we know. The shooter is in custody and the school district says he is a former male student at the high school. Broward County sheriffs say that at least 14 people have been injured. U.S. Senator Bill Nelson says there were multiple deaths. As we get more information, we will pass it along to you. 
Authorities in Oregon have identified the climber airlifted yesterday from Mount Hood. 35-year-old Mihasu Mi of Portland died after slipping on ice and falling 700 to 1,000 feet near the summit. Separately, three other climbers were found by rescuers and able to walk down the mountain. Yesterday's death on Mount Hood is the fifth in the past year. Right now, Congress continues its efforts to reach a deal on immigration legislation, but its prospect is still uncertain. As we reported earlier, there are two bipartisan bills being discussed on the Senate floor, but President Trump is promising to veto them if they don't meet his demands. This after a second federal judge in as many months ruled yesterday the Trump administration cannot end the embattled program known as DACA, which protects young undocumented immigrants. For more on the debate, our guest is Anu Joshi. She's the Immigration Policy Director for the New York Immigration Coalition. Welcome, Anu. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you for coming back. Another federal judge ruled the Trump administration cannot end DACA. Does this provide new hope for DREAMers? So I think it's important to know that this is still only a temporary fix. Um, this, the judge's decision does not allow new applicants for the DACA program. It only allows current DACA recipients or former DACA recipients to renew. So what we really need is we need Congress to act uh, to provide a permanent solution for these young people. Mm -hmm. The ruling means the program could go beyond the March 5th date. What exactly does that mean exactly? So if you have DACA right now and it's set to renew within the next six months or so, or if it's already expired, you can gather all your paperwork, go through the background check, pay your f about $500, and submit your renewal application to renew your work permit and your protection from deportation for two more years. Um, if you've never had DACA, so if you're kind of aging into the system now, if you turn 15, or if you, you know, met some of the other requirements, you are n not eligible to apply with a, with a new application. There's talk of a bipartisan deal in the works. How likely do you see this happening? So, you know, I think that we have to maintain optimism. Um, we know that about 87% of the American public wants Congress to find a solution for DREAMers, that they want Congress to pass a Clean DREAM Act. That includes almost 70% of Republicans. Um, so. You know, I still hold out hope that Congress is going to do the job that the American public sent them to Washington, D.C. to do. Um, now, the bipartisan deals that are being talked about, um, you know, we have one, the McCain-Coons Amendment uh, that would provide a DREAM Act, so provide a road to citizenship for DREAMers, um, and some smart, common sense border security provisions. Um, but that's the only one that we've seen the text of uh, in terms of a bipartisan bill. The other ones, you know, we've seen some summaries, we've heard some rumors, but nothing has actually been introduced. Now, regarding DACA, what are the ramifications of Congress if they actually don't reach a deal? So what we know is that right now, every day, 122 DACA recipients are losing their status. And, you know, the court's ruling notwithstanding, starting March 5th, that's going to go up to over 1,000 DACA recipients losing their status every day. Um, and that means that these young people's lives are basically thrown into chaos. They lose their ability to support their families, to work, and they become at risk for deportation, to be, you know, s to be torn out of their homes and sent back to a country that they've never called home. This is the only home they've ever known for many, most dreamers. Mm -hmm. So what exactly is at stake? You know, these young people's lives. Um, their families, you know, so many of them have U.S. citizen children, and this is separating families. Um, this is, you know, sending someone who came to this country at the age of one, who has lived their whole life as an American, you know, is as American as I am, except they don't have papers, and sending them back to a country they don't even know. They might not even speak the language. Um, and, you know, when you think about how cruel that is, uh, and this is a country that really values families. Um, and so, you know, we really just think that Republican leadership, Mitch McConnell, Speaker Paul Ryan, you know, if they want to be the, about, if they want to be the party that values families, then they need to value families. Absolutely. So what exactly does your organization propose as a permanent solution for the DREAMers? 
So we know what, what the solution is, right? The Clean, the Dream Act was introduced 17 years ago. Uh, it was. It's always been a bipartisan bill um, from its very introduction. In fact, uh, Senator Orrin Hatch, a Republican from Utah, who's still in the Senate today, was an original sponsor of the bill along with Dick Durbin from Illinois. Um, so, you know, we just want Mitch McConnell and Republican leadership to put the DREAM Act on the floor. Um, you know, these dreamers have nothing to do with border security. They have nothing to do with the diversity visa. They have nothing to do with legal immigration. This is about protecting young people and doing what the American public wants. So just put the Clean Dream Act on the floor. We think it'll have the votes to pass. Um, and, you know, force people to ch either choose, either they're on the side of making these dreamers uh, whole and allowing them to fulfill their American dream or they're complicit in their deportation. You just mentioned uh, something that the Republican Party prides itself on being the family values party. Uh, what would you tell Republican <coughs> um, Congress people who are against the DREAM Act? You know, I would just, um, I would say take a hard look at who these people are and their personal stories. You know, uh, for the last 17 years, dreamers that, you know, great personal risk have been coming out and sharing their stories um, and they've really turned crisis into a movement um, and it's you know pretty incredible uh, our organization has been in DC multiple times you know taking buses of people down to lobby our legislators to make sure they understand that their constituents care about this issue um, and that you know we're watching we're watching and that's what I really want them to know that we're watching and we're gonna remember how they vote is the New York Immigration Coalition planning any type of action between now and March 5th? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, we're looking to see what's going to happen this week, but, um, you know, we are going to hold our elected officials accountable. Um, there's a national day of action on March 5th that we'll be participating in. There will be groups organizing locally and in D.C. Um, because this is not something that's going to go away. Uh, if Congress can't get their act together, if they can't do what you know, 87% of the American public supports, um, you know, then what are they even doing there? So you work with dreamers often. How are the dreamers you work with, how are they holding up? Because this, I can imagine, is a very, very stressful time in their lives. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think they're forced to be resilient. They don't really have any other option. And I will say for, you know, a lot of my friends, um, DACA has only been around for five years, and so, um, they are remembering what it was like before DACA was in place when they didn't have access to driver's licenses, when they weren't able to access, you know, when they weren't able to work to support their family, to, to, to live, um, you know, the, a full life. Um, but for a lot of young, younger folks, um, they've never known a life as an undocumented person, really. I mean, you know, they were kids, and then they were able to apply for DACA. And so this is incredibly scary, um, this idea of being pushed back into the shadows, being at risk of being pulled from your home and being deported. It wears on you. Um, and so, you know, they're fighting for themselves and for their families. Um, they're not going to let Republicans hold their parents hostage in order to find, you know, a road forward for themselves. Like what the White House is proposing, um, and, you know, they're fighting. Anu Joshi from the, immigration from the New York Immigration Coalition, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Of course. Thank you. Next, art questioning migration. We'll talk to the artist. You're watching Arise America. In Haiti, vendors of the historic iron market in the capital, Port-au-Prince, are devastated after a fire left their businesses in ruins. The first fire swept through the popular tourist attraction late Monday night. The market had been rebuilt following the 2010 earthquake. It was a place where locals sold food, clothing, furniture, and other goods. No word yet on what caused the fire. Fortunately, no one was hurt. The work of Ghanaian artist Serge Atukwe Kloti is in the spotlight here in New York. The, the exhibit called Differences Between is challenging questions of migration. It opens tomorrow, and here with a preview is the artist himself. Welcome, Serge. Thank you. Good to see you. So tell us about your new exhibit. Okay, my new exhibition theme, um, Differences Between, which sort of explore migration in a way that 
it deals with objects because originally the object that I use originally come from the West and it's been reappropriated in Africa back to the West. It's a, it's a way of trading back the West, the same object, but different form and value. Um, your choice of material is very distinctive. Uh, what's the inspiration behind it? I think the inspiration comes from consumption and, and trade because the oil containers is used for transporting cooking oil from the West to Africa. Let's get our audience up to see what is the material used actually? The plastic jerry cans mm -hmm. used for transporting cooking oil, which is originally from the West transported food to Africa. In Africa, we use them to survive the water scarcity. And the consumption of these objects has become a problem, it's which is really affecting the environment. So as an artist, I'm interested in exploring that object by transforming them into an art, sending it back to the West, so that it changed the form and value where Africa benefits from that train of that object. Your, th your work centers a lot around migration. Why yeah. is the same, this, this, this theme uh, so prevalent for you and so recurring? Well, I think migration is a, is a global issue, and I think that migration is important. You know, people migration migrate for so many reasons, for economical reasons, for environmental reasons, and cultural reasons. So I think that migration also reflects my family history within the migrating from the same town, you know. So I think migration is something, it's a huge topic that artists can express with different forms and different materialism. And in that migration, you often see a lot of cross-cultural exchange of ideas and culture. Have, how, how have you seen that impacted in Ghana, specifically where you're from? I think that it's it's something that we, we are a little bit of, you know, in a challenge, you know, about migration. And I think because a lot of artists are exploring migration through different forms and different materials. So for me, um, I think that traveling around has have a lot of impact in my work. And it's also built my work setting in a way that I can extend that ideas into, you know, artistic practice. Mm. Your work is also rooted around your community. You're mm. from Ghana. Where specifically in Ghana are you from? I'm from Accra on the coast, La. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that, um, you know, La is, is a, has a very historical background because it's, it's a small town on the coast and, you know, the Europeans tried to build a fort which they never allowed. So it has a very strong history of migration. And I think that it's also have a lot of impact because I engage the community in my process. I don't separate my community from my work because they get to understand, you know, what is art and how art can be global. Yeah. Now, in terms of the, the cross-cultural impact of art, especially in the African continent, your work is actually very reflective and, and I would say, dare I say, inspired by your fellow Guinean artist, Ella Natsui. Who yeah. are some of your other inspirations? I think the, another inspiration comes from Hazome, from, from Benin, mm -hmm. who also worked with these Jerry Khans, you know, and Ibrahim, who is one of the young artists who is doing well in the country. Yeah. And do you, d does the artist community in Ghana exchange ideas? Do you meet regularly? Because art is expressed in many different ways. Your medium is tangible. Jared can to use repurposed materials. Uh, what sh could other artists learn from your, your, your material choice? I think um, there are a lot of materials available in the country that we are facing difficulties dealing with them. You know, so there are available materials. and. I know my, my practice is quite open for people to explore, you know, depending on the ideas and the approach to the material. So, but I mean, we have a very huge art community now and we engage in, on social levels and we have arts exhibitions together, art talks and, you know, and yeah, work together as well. As an artist living and working in Africa, what message would you give to other artists? Because oftentimes artists, May they may have been born in one of the future countries, but then leave or go to Europe or go to the States, but you're choosing to stay in Ghana. What message would you give to other artists who think, are from the continent? Well, I think my message is to, for them to strive because Africa is the focus now in the art world. And I think that, you know, most of them travel because of uh, economical reasons, you know, and now that there's available opportunities on the continent, I think that they should just be um, very interested in you know narrative in the continent which they can explore globally you know yeah so it's about building content from 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 you know the country you brought up a really important point how africa is now the focus um, Africa is the focus, but at the same time, what do you think the ramifications of that will be for artists? Because as you know, art prices are skyrocketing across the continent, which is wonderful for you. You're here in New York showing your exhibit here in New York. But what's the impact for the uh, artists who's coming up who may not be represented by gallery? Uh, I think that uh, it's, it's very important for artists to be represented by gallery, not just gallery from home, but it could be gallery abroad because there has to be some sort of um, collaborations where artists can 
especially if artists from Africa can have a gallery in Paris, can show, you know, so that it's going to be very global, not just focusing on the just home can, home gallery. You know, I think that collaborations abroad is very necessary for artists to explore a different part of the art scene and that. So I think that collaboration is very important. Too. That reminds me of the term the Black Atlantic, how people of the African diaspora are really spread around the world in Europe and Afri in, in the Americas, North and South. What impact do you think that's had on your work as well as global artists in the global African diaspora? I think that traveling, I've had a couple of residences from the past and I think that I always engage them in my, in my process and I think that they have different perspective of Africa, they have different experience within the space. So I think that it's add up, you know, to build sort of like a very strong conversation and dialogue around, around the situation and even around the art. So I think that um, artists is very necessary to see, you know, what is happening somewhere else and I, th I think that it has given me a lot of opportunity to be even to be live on this TV. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this is speaking of travel this is not your first time in the States can you tell me about s some other shows you've had? Yeah I've had shows in London in US this is my second solo show and I have in Germany across Europe you know and the, l the last show I had was was in Dubai which is my first exhibition in Dubai and it's really amazing interesting how performing arts it's something new in Dubai you yeah. know and where can people see your current exhibit? Where is it exhibiting? Okay, I'm showing currently in New York, Chelsea, Jane Lombard Gallery, opening tomorrow with a performance. Great. Thank yeah. you so much, Serge Atukwe Kloti at yes. the Jane Lombard Gallery here in New York City. Thanks for your time. Thank you for having me. Next, a romantic message on this Valentine's Day. You're watching Arise America. Since it's Valentine's Day, it's a good time to talk romance. In the book world, the romance genre is typically about women and by women. And according to the trade group Romance Writers of America, 84% of readers are female. But with, the, but with us today is a male romance novelist, Kelsey Minor. He promises his book will offer something for everyone, male, female, gay, and straight. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks nice for having to me. have you here, Kelsey. What is your book, uh, Unfinished Business, about? Unfinished Business takes place in the political world. So it's about this press secretary for the mayor of Chicago. That's where it, the story takes place. The mayor of Chicago, and he decides after 15 years of doing that job, he wants out. And in the process of leaving, he is given the task to replace, to train his replacement. And in the middle of this two, three month training process to get his replacement up to speed, a love affair develops. That's very intriguing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> How did you come up with this, with this idea? Some of it was taken from um, the lives of people that I know. Um, some of you it- You won't name them. <laughs> no, I will not <laughs> name them. <laughs> some, of them, some of it was taken from my own personal life. So the idea came from um, listening and talking to friends and living in my own life to make a story work. So why now? Why did you decide to write this book? Well, the book, the writing, the process started, I want to say at least seven years ago maybe wow. um, and I wrote it in between the time when I was out of work and I wanted something else to do and I've always wanted to publish a book and so I thought oh I'm out of work now is a good time to, <laughs> to sit down and and work on this so that's how the idea came about that's very focused of you so tell me about your process is, is this your first book and what was your process since you said you were unemployed mm -hmm. you're able to harness your energy and mm -hmm. write this book so what was your process the process was at the same time I was driving cross country seeing family and friends that I hadn't had the chance to visit and talk with since I was working so much and since I was out of work I would write some of it along the way like every stop I would I would write some of it so the process was drawing from some of those places and that inspiration since it was familiar to me and some of the stories involved some of those people so it was a very easy process to put it together so the process was driving across country and just taking time out to write it sounds like you were compelled mm -hmm. to write this book mm -hmm. uh, what what was the impetus? What compelled you to write this story? 
Honestly, it started with I absolutely had nothing else to do. <laughs> and I was I was sending out resumes and filling out applications all all the time all over the place and nothing was really biting at that time and so I said I need to focus my energy on something so I have this time to write this book and this amazing story inside my head let me get it out so oftentimes people writers will say I knew the ending immediately mm -hmm. did you know the ending or did it come to you did it evolve unfinished business actually the name is perfect for it because it ends on cliffhanger and the second, I smell a sequel. Part, the second part of it <laughs> is inside my brain, but it's not on paper yet. Uh, so I know how it ends, yes. Um, is it ready to be written? No. So clearly there's going to be a sequel. Yes. Okay, do you have a title yet for the sequel? I do not. You don't have a title. So gonna, no. uh, this is a cliffhanger as well. Yes. <laughs> okay. So why did you want to portray depictions of love, specifically for people of color? Because that often is a challenge in media, seeing people who look like you in loving and healthy um, relationships. Growing up, I don't think I had a interpretation or great presentation of what a I guess a healthy relationship should look like there weren't very many married people in my family and so um, the one uncle that I could remember who had been with his wife for such a long time and is still with his wife for such a long time they didn't live around me I only saw them on holidays and family events so I took what I thought a loving relationship would look like and I wrote about it in this book and weaved in some drama suspense and all of that and putting it together so that was the driving force behind I don't think I had a really good representation of what black love is I don't I don't go around proclaiming to be the expert or the <laughs> either <laughs> but I wrote about those things and it helped me to understand. So in a way, it sounds like the book was restorative and healing for you. Mm -hmm, absolutely, without How a doubt. So? Um, upon writing that book, I didn't think uh, I ever wanted to be in a relationship, but the characters, writing about these characters, um, let me see that maybe it's something that I want to explore. So it definitely was healing for you. Oh, absolutely. Uh, uh, that's fantastic. Is there one specific character that you find your audience is drawn to, and which one and why? So I think you mentioned that there's something for everybody in yes. the book. So I think that if you pick this up and you mention that romance novels primarily bought by women, read by women, um, I think if a woman picks up this book, she will be identif she will identify with two of the female characters who are I would call leads mm -hmm. in the book. One, a young who I would say vivacious, very wild child-esque, um, living in her youth. Yeah, I think people would identify with her. Um, and then there's a woman in the book who is married, happily married, her and her husband. They own a business together, so they're trying to navigate the lives of being business partners at work and then shutting that off and not taking it home and being loving partners at home. So I think there's, there's something in there for everybody that they can identify with. There's a character or something that a character does that everybody, I think, will, will be drawn to. What advice would you give to someone who's thinking about taking the plunge and actually writing a book and finishing it, because mm -hmm. we all have a lot of people who start but never finish. What advice would you give someone who's thinking about it? I would say research one. Um, make sure that you you know the story in and out, the direction you want to take it. And if you find down the road that you're writing, you're in the middle of writing it, and you said, "No, I just don't want them to meet in that coffee shop. How about they meet at the club or at church or whatever?" Um, make sure you know the story in and out. I would say know your in and your out point. You don't always have to know how the story is going to end. I knew how this story was going to end because part of it was my own life. Uh, so I know, I know how that story is going to end, but know your story in and out, research, and um, make sure you have someone who can look at it with fresh eyes because I did that as well. I sent it off to a friend and um, she was able to look at it and give me some direction. So make sure you have someone, another set of eyes to look at it. 
and um, just take your time, have fun too. So we live in a digital world. Mm -hmm. You chose to uh, make this an e-book. Can you tell us why as opposed to a print book? It was my first one and I just wanted to get my feet wet. I wanted to see if there was a, a market for it, if people would bite. And um, ebooks seem to be fun because a lot of people I know are, there are certain people who like that hardcover or softcover book in their hands, but then there are also people who would rather just download it on your tablet and, and keep going. So I thought, I saw that more people were reading ebooks than actually buying books. And ebooks are fairly not as expensive as the hardcover books. Kelsey Miner, the author, brand new author of Unfinished Business, thank you so much for your time and good luck with your new book. Thank you very much. Now, a personal message of empowerment to women. From Olympic gymnast Ali Raisman, earlier this year, she confronted USA Gymnastics doctor Larry Nasser in court with her powerful victim impact statement. Now, Raisman is celebrating, posing nude for Sports Illustrated for their series, In Her Own Words. The athlete writes, quote, women do not need to be models to be respected. Live for you. The time where women are taught to be ashamed of their bodies is over." End quote. Before we go, we want to give you the latest in the school shooting in Florida. Here's what we know so far. Law enforcement officials say there are at least two dead. 14 have been taken to local hospitals. We don't know at this time how many of the casualties are students. SWAT teams are making a sweep of the school looking for any possibly wounded children who may be still hiding in the building. The shooter is in custody. He's reportedly 18 years old and a former student at the high school. The Broward County Sheriff is calling the incident, quote, catastrophic, end quote. Thanks so much for watching Arise America in New York. I'm Aki Somalapu. We'll see you here tomorrow. Happy Valentine's Day. Thank you for coming.